Hi students, welcome to Practical Science. This is lava fluid. It's made of butane. What's one of the best things that happens with butane? It burns. And it burns in a combustion reaction. On today's episode of Practical Science, we're going to look at a combustion reaction and we're going to see how accurately we can get the value of the energy produced from that combustion reaction and compare it to our theoretical value. So let's go. So today we want to have a look at a combustion reaction. In order to do that, I'm going to use this setup right here. So what you can see is a Bunsen burner. Above the Bunsen burner, we have a tripod, a gauze mat, and a beaker. What I want to try and do is I want to carry out what's called the enthalpy of combustion. So that is the energy change that occurs in a combustion reaction. Now I don't want to, there's a couple of things that I need to to make sure that I do in order to get some accurate results here. And one of those always is to repeat the experiment. But I'm gonna walk you through the, the just one example of this today, and we're gonna get some values that we can play with. To do that, I'm going to use what we've called the NCAT formula. That is, the change in enthalpy is equivalent to the mass multiplied by the specific heat multiplied by the temperature of a specific substance. That substance is going to be water. Now what I'll need to do is I'll need to um, take a certain volume. One of the advantages of distilled water is it has a density of one gram per mil. So if I measure five mils of water, then I know I will have five grams of water. I'm gonna transfer that into my beaker and I'm going to record the temperature. So that will be my starting temperature. Then I'm going to heat that water up. Now when I heat the water up, I'm going to need to record the final temperature. I'm going to need a value for the specific heat of water, which I can get from my um, data sheet. But I'm also going to need to know, in order to calculate a molar heat of combustion, I'm going to need to also know how much fuel I'm using in this case. The fuel source is butane. This is a nice, easy way of being able to transfer some fuel into my Bunsen burner. I'm going to need to weigh my burner before and after I've concluded the experiment. So let's, first of all, transfer some of the butane to my Bunsen burner and weigh that. Okay, so let's weigh. So 56.53. Now we're gonna pop the beaker up onto the tripod. Thermometer in. Take it recording. There we go. So you can see that the temperature is rising. As we burn the fuel, when we talk about combustion reactions, one of the things that's very important is that we talk about the difference between complete and incomplete combustion. Now, I don't necessarily want this to boil, so I'll turn that off in just a second, because we've got a good, good rise in temperature. going up really nicely. 
I've only got a small amount of water here, so that's why a small amount of energy makes the temperature increase very, very quickly. So I'm going to turn this off. But I'm going to leave my thermometer in there because I want to try and pick the highest temperature I can get. One of the things that's very important when we're doing our heat of combustion reactions is that we make sure that we're measuring the temperature of the water, not the temperature of the glass. But we also know that there's some residual energy and I want to make sure that I get all of that. So I stop it at whatever is the highest value I can get. Okay, so we've heated some water up very nicely, almost reached boiling point, but I didn't want to quite get there because I know that um, the temperature will actually stabilize at the boiling point. So it won't rise anymore and that heat will, that temperature will stay the same while the water changes from a liquid into a gas. So I didn't want to quite get there, but we've had a really nice temperature rise. In fact, from 24.0 to 89.3. Now, when we put these values into our formula, we need it in Kelvin. Now I could add 273 to both my starting and my final temperatures, but when I subtracted them, I would get the same value. So you can use the change in temperature, not the absolute temperatures, but the change in temperatures to do a direct conversion between Celsius to Kelvin. So what I now am going to do is very carefully remove my very hot beaker and some of my other equipment. And what I want to do is to reweigh my Bunsen burner. Now I've had to try and make sure gas is off because I don't want to be losing mass of gas. So let's reweigh this. So my starting mass for my Bunsen burner was 56.53 and you can see now it's gone down to 56.28 grams. So now I'm in a position to calculate not only the heat of combustion for my butane reaction, but also the molar heat. Now in order to do that, we will look at a couple of uh, chemical formulae and also some mathematical calculations. So let's do them now. So what we've had to do now is some calculations. So the butane that I have here has the chemical formula C4H10. So when I calculate the molar mass of C4H10, I need to use my periodic table. Carbon has a molar mass of 12.01 and hydrogen 1.008, which is rounded up on this table to 1.01. .01. Now I also need to work out the molar heat of combustion. To calculate the heat of combustion, I need to focus on the water. There was five mils of water, which weighs five grams. From my experiment, I started with 56.53 grams and I ended up with 56.28 grams, which means that I used 0.25 grams of butane in this experiment. Now I know that this is an exothermic reaction. We can see the energy that's being taken out but in order to heat the water, I have then an endothermic process. That is, heat is actually going into the water to increase the kinetic energy of the particles. I can work out the number of moles simply using the formula number of moles equals mass over molar mass by dividing the energy by the number of moles that I've actually used. But how do I compare that with a theoretical value? Well, what I've done is I've looked up the theoretical value. What's happened to all of that energy? Well, potentially there's a couple of things. The first thing is I have to make sure that there's no gas that's actually leaking out of my Bunsen burner. Any gas that I lose is going to be equivalent to a number of moles that was not actually heating the water. The Bunsen burner here looked like it was burning with a blue flame. A blue flame tells me that complete combustion occurred. But if there's any incomplete combustion in this reaction, that is, 
If you see an orange flame with say some black soot, which is indicative of carbon, or perhaps even if the incomplete combustion produces carbon monoxide rather than carbon dioxide, then we're gonna reduce the number of moles and that's actually gonna reduce our uh, experimental value as well. So you can see the black markings on the bottom of the beaker, that's soot, that's carbon. And that tells me that there was some incomplete combustion in this reaction. And that's been another one of the sources of our error because when our fuels burn incompletely, they do not produce the same amount of energy. So there's another one of our little sources of error. And if I work out the uh, theoretical heat of combustion for incomplete combustion, that value would be lower than the one for complete combustion. Thirdly, you could see that there was a small gap between my Bunsen burner and um, my gauze mat. Now, this has been my biggest source of error. The reason that we use a gauze mat is to spread the heat out. So not all of the heat goes directly into heating the water in the, in the beaker. That means that to be accurate, what I should do is actually weigh my gauze mat, look at the value, assume that the temperature is the same, which is an assumption that's reasonable to make. It possibly might have gone a little bit higher, but I could make that assumption. So that may be a correction step that we could add as well. Then you'll see that we have a gauze mat, which has a mass of 2.32 grams. So one of the sources of error for this experiment is the fact that I used a gauze mat in order to um, try and spread the heat out a little bit so I didn't have the heat going directly on my glassware. That could have cracked my beaker. But in the process, some of the heat that's been released from this combustion reaction has actually gone into heating up my gauze mat. Now, I don't think there would have been a huge amount. And in fact, we've weighed the gauze mat. It weighs 2.32 grams. The specific heat capacity is around about 490 joules per kilogram uh, per degree C. So that only gives me an energy value of about 85.6. Joules. So that's not nothing, but in comparison, to, it's not going to change the value a lot. So where might the error have come from? Well, one of the big problems with these experiments is that the heat that's being produced by the Bunsen burner is actually radiating out in all directions. Despite the fact that it's got a nice flow that directs that um, heat onto the bottom of the beaker, and so therefore you could see that the heat was rising very, very quickly. Nevertheless, a fair amount of that heat has got into heating up some of the material in the Bunsen burner. It's gone to heating the air around it. Uh, just the fact that there's a space between the Bunsen burner itself and the bottom of the beaker means that we've got energy being lost into the atmosphere. Now we talk about energy being lost, and of course I don't mean that it's actually disappeared. What I mean is that some of the energy that's been released in the combustion reaction here is not actually being used to heat the water. So the assumption that we always make if we're trying to compare a theoretical value with the experimental value is that everything works perfectly. So it's combustion reaction, which would be complete combustion. And all of the energy that's produced in the reaction has all gone into the water to heat it up. And that's an assumption that I clearly cannot make in this case. So I've got a value of which isn't um, super high and would like a, a perhaps a better value. But if I was going to do that, what would I need to do? Well, I'd probably need to repeat the experiment. And that's one of the important things about this sort of chemistry. We can do it nice and quickly. We can repeat our experiments and get more values. But ultimately, the main thing is that once again, when you get numbers in a chemical reaction, you know what to do with it. And hopefully now, you know something more about the heat of combustion for a fuel source, you know how to calculate the molar heat of combustion, and you perhaps know what to talk about when you see some of these theoretical values not being matched by the experimental values. Thanks for watching. <music>